So with that, we're going to have um, the last portion of today's lesson on research techniques. So there's a lot for fundamentals of research and a lot for research techniques um, that we'll be covering uh, next lesson. And it'll be a long lesson. So to kind of break that up, we're going to cover the, maybe like the first like 10% of it today. And we'll be covering the rest next week. So research, this, this whole research technique stuff was inspired because obviously we want you all to be working in labs. We talked about reaching out to professors, but there's a lot of unique things in the laboratory that a lot of people don't know about, and that's perfectly okay. But it's, it's you know, no one really teaches you this in school. No one really teaches you this online. So you wanted to fill that void and kind of have this quick curriculum teaching the fundamentals of what happens in wet lab research, obviously completely for free. <clears throat> so with wet lab research, before we go into anything specific, any specific kinds of modalities, I wanna review a few things. So when you're working in wet lab, when you're on wet lab basically means you're working with actual chemicals and reagents. So when you're working in a lab, it means that you always are working with reagents, harmful chemicals, um, with DNA and stuff like that, that are very fragile. So obviously you always wanna wear gloves. Some might, might make it so you have to wear the scientist, scientist lab coat, but um, mostly, most of the time you can wear your normal clothes. You have to wear close toed shoes um, and all that. If you're a girl, they say you have to tie up your hair, uh, make sure it doesn't like fall in your face because if it falls down into your DNA or something, you ruin your experiment. And um, you have, you know, always wear gloves and you have this thing called an epi tube. So the full name is an Eppendorf tube, but they just call it tubes or epi tubes. Um, so these are these tiny miniature tubes and these are real size. So you can see how small they are. They fit in your thumbs. And they basically like pop open. So they have this little cap over here that they pop open and close. So you can put things like DNA, put things like protein, like reagents, like chemicals inside these epi tubes. So they're sterile and they can hold all this DNA and all that inside of them. And you put these epi tubes in these kind of tube racks. So obviously this is pretty, it doesn't, you know, this is like a first grade game. Like, you know, you have, you have holes, what fits in the holes, like the tubes, like it's, it's very, you know, match the shapes kind of thing. So these are obviously to make sure that these tubes stay upright, that they don't fall down, um, and that they don't, you know, open randomly and fall down and spill all over the place. So these hold the tubes. So you place these tubes inside and these tubes are used to transfer different, like transfer DNA, transfer different kinds of reagents, transfer enzymes, whatever you want. So you basically use a pipette to transfer things like DNA, liquids, whatever, from one tube to another. So pipette is basically like, you can think of it as a very tiny hand, like a very, it's like, it's like, um, it's like a very advanced straw, actually. That's a better analogy, a very advanced straw. So all a pipette is doing is that it's sucking up some fluid, it's storing that fluid, and then later, you know, um, later ejecting that fluid where you want it to. So let's say I wanted to take you know, fluid, I wanted to take some DNA fluid from here and put it here. So I would stick the pipette into the epi tube. I would then absorb everything in the epi tube um, with the pipette and put it in the other epi tube. So the way you hold the pipette is this way. It's, it's like this kind of motion. This is the right way to hold it. So over here, this kind of knob can be adjusted to adjust this number. So some of you might be wondering, well, what is this number for? This number shows you how many microliters are you taking up? So different, so making, you know, doing research in a lab is very, very similar to cooking. So just in the same way that cooking, they might say, I want you to give me, you know, four eggs and then five ounces of milk and then three grams of salt or whatever. Uh, that's probably a lot of salt, but whatever. So they give you different amounts of, of reagents to add. Likewise in a lab, you have different amounts of reagents to add. So for certain protocols, they might say, well, I need you to add 10 microliters of this DNA, but then 20 microliters of this buffer and then 10 microliters of water. So they might, so they, they, these might be the instructions. So you can adjust the amount of microliters. And microliters, again, is, is, it's like, it's a unit we use to measure liquid, but just very, very small. So it's in the same way that, you know, you, you can have a ton, you can have a kilogram, you can have a pound, you can have an ounce, um, that's all measuring weight. So you might have a liter, um, which is measuring water, like a gallon or whatever, and you can have a microliter. So microliters are very, very small. So um, it's just because obviously the things you're working with, like DNA proteins are so tiny, you need to use these kind of small um, measurements. So you can turn this knob to adjust how much, uh, to adjust the amount you wanna take up or spit out. So if I wanna take up 10, let's say 100 microliters of DNA, then I can spin this knob up to 100. And then if I press down, so you wanna press down beforehand. So when you press down, it ejects all the, you know, ejects all the empty air, and then you put it down into the fluid. Then you press up, and then it takes up all the fluid. Then you have all the fluid in there. And then next, when you want to put that fluid down into a new epi tube, you press down again. 
So that's, that's, that's basically the fundamentals of using a pipette. And the last thing I want to mention is that in medicine and in research, um, sterility is a big thing. So you always want to be sterile. You always want to um, use new tips. So this button over here, I don't know if you can see it, but you can access it with your thumb. If you click this button, it basically dispenses the tip. So you always want to use new tips when you're switching between DNA, using DNA or water. And the reason for this is that you don't want to contaminate you know, DNA with water or something like that. So that's why you want to use new tips every single time for every new reagent. So this is just giving you a better idea of um, using a pipette uh, to transfer you know, DNA from one tube to another. And yes, this is what DNA can actually look like. So it literally looks like water. It's very hard to tell the difference um, in real life because we always think of DNA as a double helix structure. I always thought it'd be like a big wire, but this is what it actually looks like. So in, in real life. Um, so yeah, that's how you use the pipette to, you would press down ahead of time. Then you'd put it into this, into this epi tube. Then you would let go and then it would suck up the DNA. Then you take the pipette, you'd put it into another tube. You'd press down again. It would expel the DNA and then you'd be done. And you dispense of the, um, you dispense of the pipette, uh, you dispense of the tip. So I, that seems a little complicated now. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later, but this is just kind of fundamentals here. And just the last thing that I did want to point out, um, if I asked you, well, I actually know, we'll, we'll get into that in two slides. So that's the fundamentals of lab work, just using epis, uh, epi tubes and pipettes and all that. So really epi tubes are ways to store what you have and pipettes are ways to transport what you have. Like it's just everything operating on a smaller micro scale. So the first thing that I wanted to go over with you all today was gel electrophoresis. So the purpose of gel electrophoresis, it answered the question, how can we separate DNA by size? So we might have several different experiments where we have different types of DNA, or we have different strands of DNA, or we might have a long strand of DNA, but really only, only interested in a small subsection. So what gel electrophoresis asks is, well, how do I separate DNA by size? So in, to my eyes, if I ask you all, which one is bigger, right? Which one has a bigger DNA? No one would be able to give me an answer. And some of you might say, well, this drop of water looks slightly big, so the DNA might be bigger here. That's actually wrong. So the drop of water, like the amount, the drop of water, like the drop, the DNA here, I shouldn't say water, but this little like drop over here, that just shows the amount of DNA I have. So it doesn't show the size of the DNA. And let me kind of give you an analogy there. If I had, okay, this is a better analogy, yeah. So if I had, you know, five, let's say I was lifting weights. If I had five pound weights and um, 50 pound weights, if I had one 50 pound weight, that's 50 pounds. If I had a million five pound weights, that's 5 million pounds. But that, but so obviously, you know, a million five pound weights is heavier than one 50 pound weight. But if I asked you intrinsically, is if, if I took one pound, if I took one weight from each one, each category, more five pound versus 50 pound, the five pound weight is still going to be smaller than the 50 pound weight. So I don't know if that, um, I don't know if that fully clicked. Maybe I should have had a visual for that. But all, all I'm trying to illustrate is that um, the amount of DNA you have has no bearing on the size of the DNA. So we need a method to actually separate DNA by its size. And that's what we use gel electrophoresis for. And virtually every lab you work in is going to have, you know, gel electrophoresis. Every lab you work in is going to have these kind of modalities of um, needing to separate DNA by size. So it has three very simple steps that you're loading the samples of DNA into these things called wells. So these wells are basically tiny pockets in an actual gel. So you use an agarose gel. It's like a, it's like a sticky, it's, it's like a, it's like a sticky jello almost. And you can, not sticky jello, it's like a squishy, it's like, um, it's like a slightly harder jello. We'll put it like that, a slightly harder jello. It's a very good way to look at it. So we're putting DNA into these tiny wells here. And then we're putting on a kind of electric power. So when we put this electrical charge to this gel, what happens is that um, one pole is negative and one pole is positive. And DNA by nature is actually negatively charged. And we'll look at this a little bit on the next slide. So based on this electrical charge, the DNA samples actually separate by size. So the DNA gets repelled from the negative end, because remember, DNA is negative, and it goes towards a positive end, and it uh, separates and dis differentiates by size. And that sounds a little complicated, so we're gonna break this down a little bit. So when we think about charges, and we learned this all in like elementary school, that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And you can think of this like, you know, relationships in a way that if you're too like-minded, you'll always butt heads. But, you know, they say opposites attract. So if, you know, you're two different people, one person's quiet, one person's loud, one person likes science, the other person likes English, then you might, you're a better match for each other because you complement each other better. It's, it's a stupid way of thinking about it, but I, I, I found that it works for me.
So like charges, like positive, positive repels, negative, negative repels, positive, negative attracts. So very simple, like magnets, right? Positive, negative poles attract. So then we ask ourselves the question, well, how does gel electrophoresis work? So it works by taking the negative, um, the negative group on DNA and expelling it and repelling it from the negative end. So that's all it does here. So we're running a charge through a gel and then it gets expelled from the negative end and the DNA fragments and basically fragments by size. And um, one thing we wanna note here is how, how do we know which size is bigger or not? Is this DNA fragment bigger or is that DNA fragment bigger? Well, all you need to know for that is the fragments that are further down, that are more towards the positive end are lighter or smaller than the fragments that are closer towards the negative end. And the reason for this is that if you think about it, if I said that, if I asked you to push two giant body bags, one bot, like two giant, let's say two giant weights. Um, if I had you carry a five pound weight and told you to run as fast as you can, you'd be able to cover a greater distance than if I gave you a hundred pound weight and told you to run, right? If you're heavier, then you're going to travel a smaller distance than if you're lighter and you weigh less. So that's the same principle with DNA. So if you're heavier, if you're a long strand of DNA, you're only going to travel um, a short distance, right? So I loaded the DNA into these wells and they only traveled a short distance. But if I'm lighter, then I'm going to travel a lot farther distance because you know I'm lighter, I have less mass, I can travel a further distance. It's basic, like common intuitive sense. And that's what gel electrophoresis kind of uses and kind of exploits. So again, I think this process might be a little bit confusing because it's harder to explain when you're not practically doing it. So again, the purposes of today is not to master this protocol, is not to be the expert in this. It's to understand just conceptually in basic terms, what is gel electrophoresis? What does it mean? What are we trying to do with it? So if, as long as you can kind of understand the purpose behind, well, the purpose of it is to fragment DNA by size. And the further it is, the lighter it is. The closer it is to the wells, the heavier it is. If you know those two things, you're set for the lab. Because your lab professor or your lab postdoctorates will teach you this again. They'll show you how to do it. They'll walk you through it if you're honest with them and tell them, you know, I haven't done this practically. But you'll be able to draw from the conceptual knowledge we're learning here to be really good experts when and, and hit the ground running. And you'll get it on your first time as opposed to your 10th time in the lab. In the lab. Um, so yeah, so that's, these are fundamentals of gel electrophoresis. And um, this is what it looks like in real life. So what you might notice here is, well, we have our DNA samples here, but we have this thing here. Like, what is this thing? It's called a ladder. So it, it's called a ladder because they look like rungs of the ladder, but we kind of use it as a DNA ruler because there's no way for us to adequately differentiate, well, what are the different lengths in this DNA gel? Because every gel is different, all DNA is different. So the ladder serves as a way to kind of standardize how far each molecule of each weight actually travels. So this is our ladder here. The L stands for ladder. And these numbers, one, two, three, they're basically the different samples that I'm loading. So when I, when I load the ladder, it, when, and this, this is a more clear sample, basically every line you see here corresponds with a different kilobase length. So kilobases is how we measure the length of DNA. So you can think of it as like, I might say, you know, for humans, you know, you're six foot five, you're five foot three. Um, you know, my, my uh, table is 10 inches, you know, uh, 50 inches long or something. So we measure in feet, we measure in inches, we measure in centimeters. So DNA, they measure the length in kilobases. The length is predicated on bases. So this is basically your microscopic ruler that says, well, if you're one kilobase long, you're over here. If you're 500 base pairs long, you're over here. If you're 300 base pairs long, you're over here. So they're measuring by base pairs. So as you can see here, a kilobase is basically a thousand base pairs, right? A kilo is a thousand. So as you go further down, you get lighter and lighter. So the heaviest um, DNA lengths are over here and the lightest DNA lengths are over here, which makes intuitive sense, right? If you're lighter, you travel faster. So based on this, if I was to ask you all, well, how many base pairs, how long is this sample? If I had no idea how long this sample was, you'd be able to say, well, it aligns perfectly with 300 base pairs. So this DNA sample is 300 base pairs. This DNA sample looks like it's like 400 base pairs-ish. So it helps you stratify DNA based on how long it is. And this ladder is like a microscopic ruler to show you how, how, um, how long every base pair is. So to kind of go back, when you load your DNA samples, you load the ladder first and you load each sample next to it. So all that means is that I'm preparing my DNA with a special dye. So I have my DNA from here. I put a special dye into the DNA and I'm putting it into this gel. So I'm putting the ladder here 
and I'm putting each, um, each actual DNA sample here. So when I actually run the gel, when I shock an electrical current through the gel, and that takes about 30, 45 minutes, I put this electrical current through the gel, then all, all of a sudden I have the ladder differentiate and I have my samples differentiate. So I can say, well, what was the lightest sample? It's over here. What was the heaviest sample? It's over here. So that's the fundamentals of how I'm using it. So now let's say that I want to apply this for CRISPR. How do we use this for actual research? How is this actually relevant? So to give you guys a quick kind of five set, like let's say two minute review on CRISPR. We said that CRISPR was a way to specifically target uh, specific strands of DNA. So you can think of it as like an eagle targeting this like white rat out of all these black rats. So it's very specific and it goes for one specific kind of base pair sequence. Um, and uh, a question in the chat, why was the 400 BP DNA further down the ladder than the 300 BP DNA? That is a good question, let's see. 400 base pair DNA further down than the 300. Yeah, so uh, Sushi, I, I, think, I, think, I think you joined um, a little bit, I think you joined a little bit later, but we were covering that the further down the ladder you go, the lighter the sample is. So this is a good question because we're putting in the shock from here. So if you go back to this, um, if you go back to this um, diagram, uh, you know that DNA is negatively charged. It has a phosphate group. So because DNA is negatively charged, it's repelled away from the negative pole. So when I put a shock here and I start polarizing the gel, then this end becomes negative, this end becomes positive. So the DNA is repelled from this end. And if I'm a DNA sample, I say, oh no, negative. So remember, negative, negatives, they repel each other. So I go from the negative end to the positive end. But remember this, if I have a race and I have one person that weighs, let's say 1,000 pounds, and another person that weighs, let's say 100 pounds, who do you think is gonna get farther in the race? Obviously the person that weighs 100 pounds because they have less body mass, they're able to run for a longer amount of time without, you know, exert, without getting as tired. So they're gonna be able to travel farther in the race. That's the same thing with DNA. If my DNA is really heavy, it's going to travel a small amount. If my DNA is not very heavy, um, it's, it's going to travel a farther amount. So I hope that helps to uh, answer your question. Um, and with that, oh, I think you're asking why the 400 was uh, greater down than the 500. Um, I, I think this actually might be mislabeled. Um, yeah, th this is actually mislabeled. Uh, the 300 and the 400 should be uh, switched. Sorry, that, that was a good observation. The 300 and 400 here should be switched. So the further down you go, the, the, you should decrease in size. So that's my bad, I actually forgot to catch that last night, but this should be 400 and this should be 300. That when you go down from the ladder, um, it goes from 1,500, 400, 300. So that was a good catch, sorry about that. Um, so let's, yeah, let's, let's continue back on CRISPR. So yes, we said CRISPR was a way to specifically target different kinds of, um, yeah, different kinds of uh, DNA sequences. And you can think of CRISPR as kind of like a wanted ad for a specific DNA sequence. If I'm interested in a specific cancer DNA sequence, it's like a wanted ad. So if I went to a police officer and said, oh, you know, I want this felon, you know, I want this criminal, let's find him. That's what CRISPR does. It's like you're giving it a wanted ad. So this is a quick graphic that CRISPR has an archived DNA sequence. It matches with, you know, the DNA sequence that you, you're targeting. And you can go and clip it off. You can go and modify it. So you can, you, can, you, can, you can cut the DNA out. You can modify the DNA. You can put DNA in. So you can do almost anything you want with CRISPR, that you find DNA you want um, that matches with the sequence that you give CRISPR. It's like a wanted ad, remember. It's super specific. And you can cut it out. You can modify it. You can put DNA sequences in. So now we should ask the question, well, um, and this is a better way to look at it as well, that, well, if I have a random mutation in myself, Let's say my original word was Takaradi Gana, and I put a random word inside of it, right? That's like mutations in a cell. That I, it, it's like a random mutation in the cell, random base pairs get inserted. What CRISPR can do is it can specifically target this uh, word, Sadza. Like if, if I was giving this analogy, my archived DNA sequence could be Sadza. And um, you know, I would specifically target this word Sadza, I would cut it out, and I would have my normal DNA sequence. So again, I'm kind of going through this a little fast because we've already covered this before, but I'm just kind of refreshing everyone's memory. So I hope it's not too repetitive. But um, yeah, so I'm excising a fragment and now it's smaller as a result. So I hope everyone can see that. But the mutated sequence would probably have, you know, an extra word in it, would have extra DNA sequences in it. And the non-mutated sequence, you know, is, sh is shorter, it's smaller. So um, how can we use, um, sorry, this should have been gelatophoresis, but, um, how can we use, um, uh, right, how can we use gelatophoresis for CRISPR? And this is another kind of analogy here that, you know, if I had a random mutation myself, and this is a lot of cancerous mutations, they're called deletions. So random base pair gets mutated. So if my DNA said something like, um, DNA obviously speaks in the language of bases. 
So DNA would have ATCG, ATCG, and you read DNA in triplets. So it'd be ATC, CCC, GGG. So it'd be a different combination of ATC and G. So if I had a random mutation, then it would be a base pair that's inserted or deleted or whatever. So to show you how, how that works in a sentence, if my original sentence was see the dog run, and I had a small mutation that I deleted one base pair, right? If I deleted one base pair, now the entire sequence is messed up because the way I'm reading it is in sets of three. So I'd read one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it'd be completely messed up. So that obviously be bad. And if I'm reading this sentence, you know, you as a reader, you'd be like, I have no idea what this says. This is complete gibberish. And same thing for the cell. If I'm interpreting the base pairs when there's a cancerous mutation and I'm trying to interpret what this sequence actually says, your cells are like, well, I have no idea what this means. Because remember, DNA is like a recipe. So if I give you the recipe for add eggs, add flour, add whatever, you can make a cake. But if all the words are messed up and, 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 and all, all the words are messed up and instead of eggs, it says add, you know, add dirt add, you know, um, poison, add fire extinguisher. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be completely messed up. You're going to add the wrong ingredients. You're going to have, you know, like poison made instead of an actual cake. So likewise for DNA, when we're using a wrong recipe and when we're using, when we're using the wrong bases, then that's a recipe for a cancerous cell, a cell that divides unrestrained, a cell that can, um, that, that's, very dangerous to, that's very dangerous to the body. So one thing to note here is that, well, obviously the lengths are going to be different for the DNA strains. So if there is a mutation or deletion, I think everyone can appreciate here that this strand is obviously longer than this strand because of the extra word that got inserted here. Or this strand is obviously shorter than this strand because something that got deleted. So we can use gel electrophoresis to see, well, with CRISPR, in what DNA sequence segments did CRISPR work? So in the realm of science, we don't always have a 100% effectiveness rate. So sometimes if we have, let's say, 100 samples of DNA and we use CRISPR on them, maybe only 95 samples will be effectively targeted by CRISPR and the other five won't be effectively targeted at all. So the other five will still have the mutation. So we can use gel electrophoresis to see, well, the shorter strand here obviously, um, obviously has more DNA and the longer strand here has less DNA because we cut out the cancerous mutation. So I can see here that, well, the strand that traveled the farthest has DNA cut out of it. The strand that traveled the farthest is the strand where CRISPR worked and the strand where um, DNA was properly modified. So in a lab setting, to kind of take a step back, what I would say is, well, I'm using CRISPR, what am I saying? I'm using CRISPR to modify DNA. So out of all the DNA I've modified, some DNA will be, will be, will be modified, some DNA will not be modified. So if I want to take the modified DNA and later put it into a patient, or later transform it into bacteria and make proteins out of it. I need to isolate that DNA, right? So I can load these samples because I can't see with the naked eye which sample is smaller or which sample is longer. I can put it into the gel and the sample that travels the furthest down, the lightest sample, the, the lightest sample is the sample with the less DNA. The sample with less DNA is a sample where I cut out the cancerous mutation. So does everyone kind of see how that works? It's, it should be fairly simple that the sample like, that travels the furthest is a sample that's the shortest. The sample that's the shortest is the sample that I use CRISPR on. And I know I'm repeating myself three or four times, but these are, I know, kind of complicated concepts to learn and think about. And it's difficult to get a true grasp of it unless you're, um, you know, getting a repetitive kind of learning modality. So um, that's, I'll, I'll kind of take a quick break there. So I'll give everyone about 30 seconds to kind of get reoriented, to take a quick break and ask questions in the chat. Um, I know this, this gel electrophoresis thing was kind of complicated, so we'll, we'll kind of, we'll definitely, we'll definitely revisit it. So 30 seconds, ask any questions you have. Okay, awesome. Look, looks like everyone is keeping on top of it. Um, I, I think before I read from the topic of electrophoresis, I will just recap it for 10 seconds, uh, just to um, drill in what we've already covered. So electrophoresis is just covering, asking the question, can we separate DNA by size? That's all. 
I'm just separating my longer DNA from my shorter DNA. And the relevance is in the length of DNA. So longer strands of DNA might be DNA with mutations and shorter strands of DNA might be DNA without mutations. So after I've done some kind of change to it, after I've applied something like CRISPR or some kind of therapy to it, that might affect the length of my DNA. But I don't know how to see that physically. So I can then run it inside of a gel and see it inside gel diaphoresis. So the samples that travel the furthest, because DNA is negatively charged, the samples that travel the furthest from the negative end are the lightest. The samples that are closest to the negative end are the heaviest. And this, and this definitely makes sense. That if I had a race with someone that was wearing a thousand pound weight on their back, which is someone that was wearing a five pound weight on their back. And I said, you guys have 10 seconds, run as fast as you can. Obviously the guy with a thousand pound weight is gonna take a two step, it's gonna take like two steps and then collapse. They're gonna be like, you know, one foot away from the start line. But the person that has a five pound weight is gonna be able to travel like, you know, uh, let's say 50 feet in that 10 seconds. And they're gonna be way further down the road than the person with a heavier weight. So that's how we know that, well, if you're heavier, you're closer to the negative sign. If you're um, lighter, you're closer to the positive sign because you were able to travel a further distance. And because of that, we can isolate strands that are bigger or smaller of interest to us. And then comes a question, if you wanted to see how, how, how um, if you wanted to see how long each strand was, and again, this should be 400, this should be 300. So just, I'll, I'll make that note. But I, let's say I had a strand that went, a DNA strand that went here, a DNA strand that went here. So I wanted to say, well, what is the specific length of this DNA strand? I can identify that, well, this DNA strand is probably about like 450 base pairs. This DNA strand is about like 1000 base pairs. So I put a ladder in that there are predefined lengths, that every length here is predefined. And I know that this is 1000, 900, 800. So I can line it up with my DNA on the actual gel after I run the gel and see how long every sample is. So that's kind of me recapping. And you can use this for CRISPR and everything. And we're going to do one more lesson today, um, one more application with PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So this is another way that we can modify DNA or not modify, that's a wrong word. Another way that we can toy with DNA to get the desired result we want. So again, gel electrophoresis was to separate DNA by size. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is asking the question, how can we take the DNA we have right now and amplify it? and have multiple copies of this one DNA. <clears throat> and what I mean by this is that let's, say that, let's say that we had a patient. Let's say this patient had a cancerous mutation. So we did, so we did, we used CRISPR and we cut out the cancer. Actually, I'll, I'll go to the diagram because it, it, I think this will be a helpful analogy. So let's say that we had a patient that had a cancerous mutation. So um, let's say the DNA, like let's say the SADSA was a cancerous mutation. So this patient had a cancerous mutation and they had a longer sequence of DNA. We put, let's say we modified this with CRISPR and we took out that DNA. And then we ran this DNA sequence through a gel. And after running this DNA sequence through a gel, we saw that, well, um, we saw that, well, the shorter DNA sequence was the one that was modified without the cancer sequence. So we ran it through the gel and we saw, well, this sequence, you know, this DNA band is obviously the good DNA band the band where the cancer mutation is taken out because it's shorter, it's further down. So now we can ask ourselves a question. We have DNA we like. We have the modified DNA. How can we amplify that? I want to put this DNA inside uh, my patient. I'm going to put it inside mice. I want to have this DNA to research on. I only have maybe like a couple hundred copies of this DNA. How can I make it so I have millions of copies of this DNA, right? How can I amplify this copy? So scientists have come up with this thing called polymerase chain reaction, PCR. Polymerase chain reaction. And the ultimate purpose is taking advantage of the fact that DNA replicates. And how can we modify the replication part? The DNA replicates really rapidly. So um, the purpose of this is obviously um, we can do a lot of things with extra DNA. So obviously we can transform the DNA into bacteria. And the next thing we'll be covering is actually transforming into bacteria. So that'll, that'll, that'll link together well. But we can modify the DNA to put it inside bacteria. Um, we can have the DNA put inside humans, or we can take the DNA. And uh, if everyone remembers, the central dogma of DNA was that it went from DNA to RNA to protein. So every DNA gives rise to proteins. So maybe I have a DNA of interest that gives off an important protein for locating cancer, or gives an important protein to combat cancer, or gives off an important protein to detect the coronavirus or to attack the coronavirus. 
So if I have a million copies of the DNA, that's more protein that I can produce. So I can do tons of things when I have more copies of DNA. It's important to have lots of copies of DNA to experiment on, to put into bacteria, to put into humans, to test on mice, to make proteins from. So now that we've established that, it's important to have lots of DNA. Um, the question is asked, how do we make lots of DNA? So I'm gonna be representing this diagram like three different ways. So again, it might seem complicated, but it's really not. So there's three main steps. Firstly, we denature the DNA. We separate the DNA. So if everyone remembers, DNA is like this double-stranded helix, right? So it's like I'm separating this strand. Um, I hope everyone can see what I'm doing here. I'm separating this strand from this strand. So this strand gets separated from this strand. I'm basically un unclicking these two strands. I'm basically separating the base pairs from each other. So this is like every strand, this is like one strand of DNA, this is another strand of DNA just kind of laid out so it's easier for you to see. So I'm separating the strands. So now I have one strand of DNA. Then I'm basically building on top of these strands. So I'm putting in something called a primer and we'll cover this later, but a primer basically helps to, um, um, uh, let me, this is actually on the next slide, but a primer actually helps a molecule called DNA polymerase. And I know I'm throwing a lot of terms at you, but all DNA, and remember, if something ends in ASE, ACE, it means it's an enzyme. So all DNA polymerase does is it completes the sequence. So it's, 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 it basically fills in the base pairs. It fills in the gaps. And then I basically extend it and make sure it fills in all the gaps. So I might start with one DNA pair, but if I denature it and fill in the gaps, I have two DNA pairs. So this is very much like if I'm playing with Legos, right? If I'm playing with Legos and I have one, you know, one Lego block, if I unmatch the Lego blocks and then I match, rematch them with different Lego blocks, um, then, at, then, um, they, then I have two, that's, that's probably not the best analogy, but, um, let's, let's, I think this will help, this diagram will help cover it up a lot, uh, cover it up a lot better. So again, to kind of backtrack, um, DNA polym, uh, polymerase chain reaction, PCR is best for amplifying DNA. So what I mean by that is I'm making several copies of the same DNA strain. So to kind of look at this diagram more in depth, to look at it closely, I have this original DNA with two strands. I have DNA primers and I have nucleotides that happen, um, that occur naturally in the cell, or you can add them synthetically. So all I'm doing is I'm denaturing it. So I'm putting it in really hot temperatures. So these base pairs can't hold together anymore. These base pairs separate. So now these base pairs have separated and I have two strands of DNA. Then I add DNA primers. And DNA primers are basically like, um, they're like, you can think of it as like these landing strips for airplanes. So if any of you have ever, you know, flown on airplanes, I know a lot of you haven't in a while because, um, you know, the pandemic, but these lights here, these landing strips indicate for planes, where should I land? Where should I go? Because otherwise, if it's dark in the night, they might crash into a building or they might not land in the right place. So that's what DNA primers are like. They tell the rest of the nucleotides, here is where you should go. Here is where you should come and build on the DNA sequence. So that's all they do. So the DNA primers come here and tell the nucleotides to complete the DNA sequence. So now I have two DNA, so now I have two DNA strands, whereas I used to have one. And this is important to point out that this DNA strand is the same as this DNA strand, right? They have the exact same, you know, they have the exact same double strand conformation, the exact same nucleotides. But now instead of one DNA, I have two DNAs. So I know what you're thinking, right? Like it's like, okay, you have two strands of DNA, big deal. But the beauty of polymerase chain reaction is that you do it multiple times. So if I do it, and if I do one cycle, then I have two strands of DNA. If I do two cycles, then I have four strands of DNA. Three cycles, eight strands. Then more and more, it's all exponentiating, two to the power of. So if I do 35, if I do 35, um, if I do this 35 times, I'll have millions and millions of copies of DNA because it exponentially grows over the course of time. So I hope everyone can see here that right, I have my original strand. I'm splitting it up so that I, the blue is the original strand. So I'm splitting it up. Then I have a new strand added from my primers and the nucleotides that I had. And then they keep on dividing more and more and more and more until I have millions and millions of strands of DNA. So again, the DNA, I start with one strand of DNA. I add primers that tell the nucleotides, that tell uh, TAC polymerase, which is the main, um, main kind of enzyme that works, to build on top of it and to build the rest of the DNA. Um, you can think of them like if you're playing with Legos, this primer, the nucleotides, uh, TAC polymerase, 
these are like the construction workers. These are like you, right? These are the person that's playing with the Legos that assembles all the Legos, that puts them all together, that puts together the building blocks that, con that makes the confirmation of DNA. And an application of this that you can use is again with CRISPR, that if you want to edit specific strands of DNA with CRISPR, you can go and use uh, PCR to go and replicate the same strand of DNA multiple, multiple times. Um, and if I have a certain strand of interest, um, let's say with, uh, with CRISPR, if I have a certain strand of interest, I can use PCR to go and replicate that same strand, you know, and have a million copies of it. So um, I, I think that might, that, that's something I should have covered with the advanced group, but um, that's, that's, I'm, I'm just showing everyone that there are, you can use this for CRISPR, you can use this for other examples too. But that's a fundamental of PCR. It was quicker than electrophoresis, but again, as a recap, it asks the question, how can we have multiple strands of one strand of DNA? So I'm separating it, I'm building on top of it, and then I'm kind of extending and making sure that I complete that build. So again, I have one strand of DNA, I, and I denature it. So I, I apply high temperatures so that the base pair separate. It's like glue that separates, right? Glue that gives up when I put, like, put it under 100 degrees. Then I put in specific kinds of molecules, proteins, enzymes that build on top of it that build each of these sequences and complete the DNA sequences. At the end, I have two DNA sequences, whereas I only started with one. And when I apply this multiple, multiple times, I can go from two to four to eight to 16, and it starts exponentiating rapidly. So then I'll have 64, then 128, then I have, you know, it keeps on growing and growing and growing until I have thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of copies of the same DNA. And I can use these copies of DNA for, for tons of purposes, like making proteins, um, injecting into animals, um, using it for therapies with humans. So it's a lot of cool applications. So we'll definitely be covering this next time. I, I wanted to give everyone a brief overview because these will be two of the most long kind of advanced um, topics. The rest are very straightforward, uh, very simple, but these